What would it be like to start a security program from scratch? As the first CISO at a startup, Guillaume Ross got to do just that. One year and Guillaume joined Business Security Weekly to share his story and challenges. In this throwback episode, Guillaume discusses why it's not always easy starting from scratch either. I hope you enjoy this episode and have a great Thanksgiving day. Everyone here at Security Weekly is thankful for you watching or listening. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Broadcasting live, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. Guillaume Ross has worked in security for way too long by now. He's been a defender, a consultant, managed blue teams, and is now CISO at Fanaptic. Building security from scratch in an environment where it is critical. Guillaume, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Hi, nice to see you. Uh, I hope I don't need any football knowledge to be on the show because uh, you're probably going to kick me out pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, this crew is kind of football. Like my boss is soccer, and that might translate well into Canada a little bit. I mean, maybe a little uh, football. More of a right? baseball a guy, so. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. It's good. Uh, Guillaume, I, you know, this discussion is really interesting to me because you are about 55 weeks into your role as a CISO at a brand new startup. And not many people get to start from scratch. Because when you think about it, let's see, I have no security program, no security culture, no technical debt. I, I pretty much have nothing. So where do you start? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So first of all, it's pretty rare for a startup to hire a security team or even a single security specialist from the from the beginning. It really has to be a startup where security is going to be extremely important for that to make sense. I think for many startups, it actually would make more sense to have um, someone on a retainer as a consultant, you know, here and there, but maybe not someone full-time. Uh, we've been two full-time uh, security employees at uh, Fanaptic since the company was less than two months old. Um, and as you say, you don't have anything, right? So you've got to start with things you never really thought you would get to uh, help decide uh, as a CISO um, in, in a company. Things like, basic things like, are we going to support Mac or Windows or both of them? And what language are we going to pick to um, build our backend? And what cloud environment, what cloud vendor is it going to run on? You get to make these decisions from uh, from the beginning, which it's great because you get to pick what you want and build it the way you want. And then you don't get the excuse or maybe the downside, which is uh, you always think it would be easier if you'd done this properly uh, in the beginning, which it, it is true for many things. But there's also a lot of stuff that's pretty hard to bootstrap. Yeah, I mean, Jason, just think about this for a second, right? How many times you get to like pick the the technology? Oh my god, stack, Greenfield, right? Open Canvas. I mean, you know, I was the first CISO, first security leader for two different IT professional services, managed services organizations, and you know, one of the first things in both instances I had to tackle was know what I have, and that was yeah. probably one of the most difficult pieces to to, to figure out, right? And and then. And then start doing risk classifications against it. What's legacy? What's end of support? What's you know what's what's uh, end of sale? And and just really ripping through the assets, finding where the data is, finding all those nooks and crannies in the organization. Open Canvas, man. That's oh, that's awesome. Yeah, exactly. It is. It is awesome. And then you get to spend time on different things or different challenges, right? Like for example. Um, do you start doing code reviews when the company is one month old, right? How much of a hit on productivity will that be mm -hmm. versus what's what's the benefit going to be once you're one year in? And that's something that we're very, very strict on. We've established that as a policy really early on. And then we realized that having these types of things uh, enforced as a, like policy as code, right? Like can, the kind of things and processes mm -hmm. that you just can't bypass because that's your way of working, right? Like you're you're working on code, someone needs to review it, two people need to review it, or you're changing encryption settings, the security team needs to review it. By enforcing that from the beginning, it turns into a, a culture after not that long. People get used to it, then the new employees that you onboard, um, they start working with the rest of the team and it just becomes the, the new normal. And I find that you have to spend a lot less time on uh, these things and these, these different arguments. 
and it makes a huge uh, benefit down the road. We're already seeing it, uh, you know, one year down the road. Uh, and as you were saying, for knowing what you have, that's another big advantage of starting from scratch, but also starting from scratch in a uh, remote, uh, all cloud world, right? Like if it's, if something is not listed by the cloud vendors APIs, we don't have it unless it's maybe a laptop, which then is listed by our MDM, right? There's literally no piece of hardware that exists somewhere that I can't know we have through a few API calls. Uh, and that's uh, something I really wished I had many of, uh, very often many jobs before. Yeah, no, that's that, that's great. I mean, you know, uh, I sit back and I look at it. You're you're literally embedding security into the DNA of your organization out of the gate, right? So it becomes part of the culture, becomes part of the habit, and 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 what people are doing within their jobs on the day to day. But it's also future proofing you and allowing you to be scalable later on. You know, I I kind of came from the opposite end of the spectrum of trying to take an enterprise level organization who didn't have a security program or security team. And then you try to turn the ship. And it's hard to win hearts and minds, and it's hard to ingrain culture into you know twenty six years of history of doing things a certain way. Yep. And uh, you know, winning, winning those hearts and minds that was a good portion of probably my first year. You know, putting my foot in the door is just gaining trust. Yeah, culture is yeah, such a hard you... thing, right? I mean, we all struggle with that. I think that's one of the mm -hmm. most challenging parts of the the job is just trying to figure out how to get the culture shifted, especially in an organization where there hasn't been security, right? I had a similar experience to Jason where, you know, I came into an organization, 60 years old, the first CISO, right? They've never had a CISO before in 60 years, publicly traded company. And you think, how do you how did you get by, right? With no people, no process, no technology. So yep. being able to, I think, get in front of that and get the culture is just such a phenomenal start jump start to the right you know way to run a program yeah it's it's a definitely a much different uh, type of environment but then you also have a, a set of different challenges that come with you're an early company you don't really have customers yet right like your company was liter literally created uh, two weeks ago and i think that balancing productivity and security becomes even more uh, important there than uh, in enterprise for example because I think the top risk for a lot of startups is just not getting customers, not getting funding and not existing Revenue. anymore. And that <laughs> you don't have anything to protect. Yeah, yeah. Um, that being said, there's so much automation that's available now that if you focus on a few tools and automating the processes, then you cut down on how much you need to document because the process is automated and enforced so people can't really go around it. So they'll learn how to do it. Uh, and, and I think one thing that's really key is you really want to pick a few vendors um, and use them as much as you can. So, for example, if you're looking at, uh, let's say, AWS, Azure, GCP, they're all pretty good. Uh, notice I didn't mention many other cloud vendors there when I said they were all pretty good. Uh, and between those three, they all have a lot of different security features um, for you know, logging. Their access management is super granular and all of that. But you know you're not going to have a team of 20 people to manage that uh, in a month or in two months. And so you really need to be sure that you, you know, it's it's a mistake, I think, in enterprise to buy too much stuff and not use it enough. And you you end up with, you know, shelfware, things use at like 5% of their capacity, and then you end up paying for it, and it increases your tax surface a lot. Well, you just don't have that that benefit in, in like a pre-funding, uh, like a pre-series A company. It's just not going to happen. And that forced focus makes you uh, design things that are just better. Yeah, you have an interesting environment. So when I was at Tenable, when I was doing the strategy work there back in 2016 timeframe, I came up with this model that said, you know, if everything moves to the cloud, what's left for me to manage, right? Maybe my 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 mobile device or my um, a laptop, a, a, a Wi-Fi access point, and that was it, right? That's basically what you have. Like, I, I was. You know, I was kind of hypothesizing this is where the world could be in a few years. You're actually there. I mean, you're all up and running in a cloud environment with users remote accessing the cloud environment through their their individual devices or, or maybe even company-owned devices. But what does that do to the threat profile? Like, how do you – what's different when everything is remote and has to connect into this cloud infrastructure? Because not many people have to do that. Um, I think the, the first thing is, 
if you're a company that makes we're, we're, what we're doing at Finaptic, uh, this is not a product pitch, but just so you understand the, uh, the risk profile that goes with that is we're building APIs that people can use to, uh, to create uh, their own banking products and offer them. So for example, if you were a major retailer and you wanted to have like a checking account, um, you could use our APIs and offer that through your website. And we handle all the stack, regulatory, technical, everything. So we're essentially a cloud provider uh, of our own. You know, it's banking accounts uh, as a platform, uh, banking products as a platform, I, I should say. So in our case, that lets us focus more on what we're building, the security of the code that we're building. However, we're using a lot of features in cloud environments that are actually pretty pretty complex, and you need the time to focus on using those, uh, using those securely. Where you can pick managed offerings, in most cases, that's going to be a good trade-off. Uh, if you're a company using the cloud, especially if you're not a service provider building IT solutions for other companies. But in some cases, you'll just have uh, needs that are too complex. You can't just use what's out of the box and you still end up building something that's a little bit more complex uh, in the cloud, but then you, you can really focus on uh, on what's more important. And I, I think one of the main advantages of the cloud is unlike, say you have an existing company that's using maybe multiple clouds, data centers, got a bunch of network devices, servers, and everything else. Just something as simple as, as simple, something that should be as simple as access management, which is definitely not that simple in, uh, in enterprise. Mm -hmm. You've got 62 places where that actually happens, and that's 62 places for increased attack surface and, and mistakes. Whereas if you're all in with a cloud vendor like AWS or GCP, you don't have a router somewhere that's controlled with some weird radius server somewhere. It's all in the same IAM. The downside is that th that IAM is extremely granular and extremely complicated as well. So there's there's trade-offs, but I think you can definitely make better use of your engineers to build a platform that's going to be uh, reliable and, and secure because you're, you're not worrying about... Uh, hardware and everything else, right? Like you're, you're not running uh, your own open stack and your own Kubernetes and all of that. Now, now Guillaume, um, I, I know I dealt with this a lot. Um, you know, at, at my previous organization, we had, you know, we had 35 of the Fortune 100 who were our clients. How does migrating all cloud help from a vendor risk management perspective? Because I know from, you know, our on-prem, because we, we were hybrid, obviously, right? We had a lot of on-prem, a lot of gear that we owned, data centers, you know, all over the country. And uh, you know, vendor risk management in, in our audits were extremely complicated, especially from our regulated customers. Ha you know, moving to the cloud and moving to you know some of the best of the breed in, in you know out there, how, how, does that help? Does it hinder? Does it make it more complicated? How how does that work for you? Well, I think in in our case, we're a cloud provider, and there's no way we can offer what we do as on prem. Like it's just mm -hmm. not possible from a yep. like a business model point of view, but from an everything point of view, right? Like we run the stack for people that can't have access to the stack uh, themselves, right? They use our, our APIs. Uh, I've worked for cloud vendors that had uh, both options. Um, and I would say it's much simpler when you only have to worry about running in one of the two, uh, one of the two environments. Um, the downside I would say is, for example, if you're a security vendor, I've worked for a variety of different uh, security vendors, there's still a lot of resistance to um, necessarily having to send the data to the cloud or sending uh, or, or giving privileges to uh, cloud instances. Uh, but that's, that's fading away uh, pretty fast. And I would say the main difference is just that uh, the, the threat profile is completely different and you've got to be worried more about uh, things that happen in real time, uh, how the data is um, how the data is secured and be sure you have a pretty good level of confidence with your with your vendors. Whereas uh, if it's on-prem, you still need to have that same level of confidence with the vendors, right? Because ultimately you're going to take code that they've written and run it in your own environment, but you might be able to put a few, uh, a few different controls uh, around it. That's not really the uh, the environment that uh, that we're in we cannot provide that uh, on prem so what we're trying to do is build the environment that's the safest that we can make it so that our customers are very um, confident that by using our solution their data is as secure as uh, as possible and that includes being very um, transparent with them um, explaining exactly how we protect XYZ, right? Like for a lot of things, the it's like encryption. The secret should be the key, not the algorithm. And I think the same is true for protecting uh, cloud environments. You should be open about what you're doing. Um, that shouldn't be what's protecting the uh, the yeah. data your customers trust trust you with. 
Yep, and, and be upfront with any limitations that the vendor may have in you know compensating controls you put in place, right? Yeah. Guillaume, you're in an interesting environment. You're in the financial space, which is highly regulated here in the States and in, in Canada and pretty much anywhere in the world. What does that do? I mean, when you think about it from a regulatory perspective, how do you account for things like regulatory compliance and some of the regulatory stuff? Have you just integrated that all in from the security program, like up front, so that there aren't like I think about the old banking system, right? You had a chief risk officer, maybe a chief compliance officer. You had a chief security officer. You had a lot of structures. I don't think you have that, do you? I mean, you've streamlined this pretty well. Well, we we do have a head of uh, regulatory compliance because of the space that we're in, and that touches a lot of stuff that's not necessarily even technical. For example, uh, consent is very important in banking applications, right? And and the way you store who consented to what is, is extremely important. And privacy is also something we think is super important. And we have uh, someone running a team uh, dedicated to that. And of course, we work together a lot um, because if you can't protect the information, then it's never going to be private, right? Um, that being said, the there's a huge advantage to being able to do policy and infrastructure as code because it lets you prove what you're doing um, very easily and it lets you control changes uh, very easily, right? Like if everything is a git uh, commit and then a PR and you can see who approved what and changed what, that really will help you with these uh, different audits and regulatory compliance. And I find that the best way to approach that is do security as well as you can, and then you're going to get 75% of the regulatory stuff uh, covered. And then everything else you just implement um, as needed, right? For example, if you just look at something like PCI DSS, there's a lot of stuff in there that's just a good practice. There's some stuff in there that's completely stupid. I'm thinking of password requirements, for example, but most of it you're going to do anyway, right? So if you start doing that from the beginning and everything is enforced as code, then even going through an audit is actually pretty straightforward because you have a provable uh, audit log of all the changes that happen and of those policies being uh, being implemented. Now, the, the question is, how many of these policies can you actually enforce versus others that are more uh, like manual processes and, and different policies that just cannot be uh, automated? But that's the, the biggest win with starting from scratch is you can start with the goal of automating most of it from the beginning. Um, and, and to be honest, I'll, there's a lot of overlap between all the different uh, regulations and compliance regimes out there. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that has been one of the big challenges, I think, for, for larger organizations. You, you streamline that pretty well by just integrating it into your program, which means your software development lifecycle, that, that whole flow, that CICD pipeline build process is critical for tracking those changes and, and really maintaining yep. the audit log for you. I mean, it's all around your code, which is different than most other providers who have a lot of other legacy uh, infrastructure to support as well. Yeah, so er early on, the first few months, that's actually what we we spent a lot of time on was building all the, all the tooling that we need to run our solution. So CI, CD, obviously a big part of that. And that's where you start putting in the checks, right? Oh, you, you don't fulfill X, Y, Z. You can't make it even to dev. And then you make it to dev. What do you need to make it to pre-prod or prod? Knowing that the goal is to be deploying very, very often, right? So we're not going to have like a, a, a change management review board that meets once a week to approve things that are going to be done on the week with four Thursdays or whatever. Um, and so you get to design that from the beginning, but you also only have one thing you're really working on, right? It's not like you're working for a company that's made 16 acquisitions in the last five years and has like 100 different products built with different technologies, completely different. And so you can make sure that the entire company follows the same, um, the same processes. And then it becomes a matter of enforcing things in the pipeline and then make it, making it easy for people to have that as close to them as possible. So for example, if you're implementing, like something that's really good to do from the beginning is just static uh, application security scanning, right? Mm -hmm. You do that from the beginning, people get used to the idea. If you have a process for managing exceptions and false positives, that just becomes a new way of working. And you start when you have zero lines of code, it's not gonna be a huge pain in the butt. If you start when you have 10 million lines of code, that's gonna be a big project. And you want to enforce that in that pipeline, but at the same time, make that available to the engineer so they can run it on their own side, um, so they'll know if they made a mistake before they push it in, right? Like that sounds obvious to anyone who's implementing any of that, but now you have the added benefit of doing that 
at the beginning of the company. So everyone has started doing it from the beginning uh, and that becomes ingrained in the culture, right? And as new people start working here, they just see that, okay, here's how the build pipeline works, the different checks we have before things can go to production. And it's just a new, uh, the new normal. And that lets you focus on then, you know, the more advanced stuff. But you're right, then the CICD, I think is the, critical attack surface for a lot of uh, a lot of cloud vendors right that's if you can get into the ci and you can just insert a script there that's why i think the uh, code cov vulnerability and uh, i think breach from april or march was very interesting because a lot of people loaded that tool straight on their ci environment and i think mitigating the risk to your ci environment becomes very very critical and a lot of companies have started using these tools a lot without necessarily realizing that it's the new uh keys to the kingdom yeah it's just like the shift of where the attack surface is is now in your ci cd pipeline the open source programs and projects that exactly. you're using but here's the beauty because you've integrated static analysis, software composition analysis, vulnerability scanning, et cetera, right it, in automated it in the pipeline, you, you you see it. You can you can detect it. You can address it right away instead of waiting, oh, it's time for the monthly vulnerability scan. Let's go out and scan our network and see what comes back. I mean, you're doing it real time, which is which which definitely has an advantage. Yeah, the goal is definitely to do things real time and block when something you know, doesn't meet whatever requirement. Of course, you still need to do some checks after that because something could be discovered after the fact or, or whatever. But I think a key part of that, if we're, t we're talking about, you know, libraries and everything that, that makes up uh, what you're building, your, your bill of material, if you want, when you get to pick the technology you're going to be using, that's something that you can have a pretty big impact on. So for example, I'm not going to name names, but some languages have some package managers where there's a lot of libraries to do very, very minor things, right? Like you want to compare two numbers, let's go get an open source library to do that. Um, and those typically have um, millions of packages and then there's vulnerabilities all the time. Other languages, it's not as bad, but there's no there's no guarantee. So from the beginning, if you can build that graph of dependencies that you have and start tracking that, that's going to give you a huge advantage. Um, and it's so much easier to do at the beginning than to do uh, once you're like seven, eight years in and you've got a million uh, million different things, right? Like that graph, it can still fit on a screen. You don't need a 52-inch plotter to print it out. Oh, I'm just giggling inside, knowing the history of all the different things that we've had to try to fix over the years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think Ben's back. Ben, I, I wanted to give you I a am. chance to uh, ask uh, Guillaume any questions, because this was like right in your wheelhouse, baby. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, look, I'm just interested, you know, when you think about, you know, taking a program from the start like this in a real green field. Where do you come out on the balance between security, you know, sitting in the typical, you know, security organization under a CISO infrastructure or, you know, how do you align that into, you know, some organizations that wanted to sit more in the dev? How did you come out on that? And where did you, how did you we, factor in the balance of, you know, that security? Yeah, I don't think um, having a huge security team is, is a recipe for success in this type of uh, organization. I think it's much more important to have um, very good security skills in the engineering teams, in the um, being like developers or DevOps, um, as well as even distributed into uh, the product teams, right? Like threat modeling needs to start with the product team. And so that that's what we're doing. We're delegating uh, security skills in different teams, making sure that uh, we're well covered uh, everywhere. And then by enforcing a lot of stuff in, in process, we're making sure that everyone learns, you know, as we go. So for example, People get used to doing threat modeling when there's new features coming on. Well, then the business people start being able to do threat modeling, not just for, not necessarily for like the, the technical aspects, right? Like, oh, we should do fuzzing on this because what if someone can inject whatever? But there's a lot of security that's just misuse of uh, business process vulnerabilities and different things like that. So I think the, the key to success is to have a security team that's that's more worried about getting everyone else uh, up to speed as well as you know of course uh, policy and monitoring and incident response but really having more security skills in other teams is uh, is the most important and that's why sometimes i see these numbers like oh there's 3 million security jobs that need to be fulfilled and i 
wonder where, where the numbers came from. Um, but also, I think it would be much more valuable to everyone if everyone working in engineering, if you're a DevOps, if you're a developer, if you had more security skills, I think you can make much more of an impact than you've, you've all seen these security teams with a thousand people on them, right? It, 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 these companies still get breached, right? Because why is there a thousand people in security? Because there's so many different business units and there's a lot of people that are a few levels disconnected from what's actually uh, actually happening. And then you, you suddenly have a lot of overhead that is needed due to the organization that you have, but it doesn't mean the result is going to be great. So um, yeah, so I, I'm not one that would wish that I had a team of a thousand people in uh, five years. I would much rather wish that uh, we had the best uh, developers and DevOps uh, people in general. Yeah, I think the alignment with the business is so much more important, right? And that's what I think you're talking about is really making sure that you're you're driving security into the business for the areas that are responsible for it, and you know that oversight or you know c- c- making sure that they're complying with policy and, and strategy and direction is really a lot more important. So it sounds like you you yeah. kind of it's, the right it's really to that. get to the point where like security is just a facet of quality. You know, it's yeah. like it's it, it can be a disaster it's if a there's a problem, point. but when you think about it, like a bug is a bug and a problem is a problem. Um, and once that becomes part of the culture, it becomes much easier to have a, a security team that's more focused on uh, policy and, and and helping everyone else uh, get uh, get up to speed. And for example, we have people, uh, we have a, an application security specialist working embedded directly in the engineering team, and that's that brings huge uh, returns, right? Because you can have that type of person working on the most critical um, code from a security point of view, but also just through osmosis of working with someone like that, everyone else uh, levels up like pretty quickly. It's uh, it's impressive. Yeah, I think it gets back to what you talked about and what we talked about at the start. It's culture, right? If you can get the culture yeah. right from the get-go, I mean, I think it pays huge dividends and that's where a lot of people aren't focusing. They're focusing more on the technology, not on the human and the culture side. Yeah, and, yeah, and using think- using process to create uh, create that culture, right? Because you, if when you're starting from nothing, especially in a remote team, right? Like it's my first time working for a brand new remote company. I've worked remote before, but there is definitely something a little weird about working with a bunch of people you've never met before. Because we started during the peak Nobody's of ever the seen pandemic. Each other. Like the only person I'd seen was <laughs> my boss who brought me uh, my laptop. Uh, and then we got set up so we would drop ship them pre-configured and so no one saw anyone else for a while, right? <laughs> um, and it's you, you have to put some effort into establishing the culture of the company in general and security is a, is a part of that, right? It can't just be you know 25 people all over the world not talking to each other and just doing their own thing. Yeah, I like the way you equated security to quality because yeah. in your case, the quality of your code is also the security of your code. And, and if you think about it that way, it's a really great analogy for people to think about when we went through the 80s with the quality assurance in the manufacturing environment. If we can do the same things in our code bases, we'll be a much more secure um, environment, like world, because we use so much software. Yeah, and sec- sometimes as um, technology specialists, we can think of IT security being the most important thing and security of the code. But when you're working in finance, uh, there's a lot of security that is business process, right? Like fraud is a huge problem and account misuse is a huge problem. I think like social networks have the same problem where they can be misused a thousand different ways and traditional security teams would be like, well, you know, there's no vulnerability. Nobody exploited anything. They just used it and, you know, that's... That's what happens, uh, but you need that to be embedded, and you need you, you need uh, the entire organization to take ownership of all these different aspects. Because at the end of the day, customers not really going to care if they lost money because of a you know business uh, email compromise or an actual vulnerability, or it was just like a process that wasn't good enough. Um, it's not going to make a difference to them, and uh, you shouldn't necessarily treat those as uh, as separate when you do things like threat modeling, for example. You should look at all different ways things can go wrong. And, and part of your success is going to be your relationships with the other executives. I mean, you talked about your compliance and, and regulatory officer. I'm sure you two have to have an extremely tight relationship. So that way you're apprised of everything happening within you know, his realm. That way you can translate it back to your team. Oh yeah, yeah. We we work together all the time. Um, Mahira, hi, if you're, if you're listening. And I think it was really important to have someone from the beginning that is really focused on these... Uh, 
on these aspects because we can already start thinking a few years down the road, right? Like what's going to happen when we have X amount of customers or when we have these features. And by discussing these th these things early, you can do things like start to um, have an idea of what kind of resources you're going to need to build what uh, what you're going to build, right? Like as the security person, you're going to be like, oh, I want everything to be uh, encrypted 62 times with uh, zero knowledge and the keys are in the... You know, like, Okay, but why? And what's the important data? And what statements uh, can we make to our customers saying that we're protecting the data in in whichever way? And yeah, that's been a huge uh, huge deal uh, hiring her um, pretty early on as well in the first uh, six months or so, I would say. That's great, uh, Guillaume. Thank you so much for sharing your story on Business Security Weekly. No, you're welcome. It was a blast. Thanks for having me.